Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 54 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. The United States is a diverse nation. Many of its citizens hail from ancestors who migrated to North America in the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, and now 21st centuries. With such diversity, how do we describe what the United States is and what its people stand for? What is the underlying ideological current that links Americans together, regardless of their ancestral and regional differences? For many Americans, it's the ideas embodied in the concept of American exceptionalism. The ideas that the citizens of the United States stand for justice, freedom, and equality. Today, we explore American exceptionalism and the ideas that it embodies with John D. Wilsey, author of American Exceptionalism and Civil Religion, Reassessing the History of an Idea. During our conversation, John reveals how he and others define American exceptionalism, the Puritan origins of American exceptionalism, and how the ideas of American exceptionalism fit within the concepts of patriotism and nationalism. Are you ready for Ben Franklin's world's first exploration of an idea? Let me introduce you to John Wilsey. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an assistant professor of history at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary's Houston campus. His research interests include the history of ideas, religion, and the founding of the United States. He is the author of two books, including One Nation Under God, An Evangelical Critique of Christian America, and most recently, American Exceptionalism and Civil Religion, Reassessing the History of an Idea. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, John Wilsey. Thanks a lot, Liz. Glad to be here. John, American exceptionalism seems to be a popular buzzword these days. I mean, I've seen it used in op-eds, presidential campaign speeches, and in the headlines of major news articles. Would you tell us what American exceptionalism is and why you're interested in it? Okay, so here's the final word on what American exceptionalism is. (laughs) Just kidding. It's a very uh, ambiguous term, and it it often depends on who you ask. But in short, uh, American exceptionalism is an assertion, a patriotic assertion, where people say that America is the most uh, powerful nation in the world, the most generous nation in the world, most influential nation in the world, in the history of the world, in the history of humanity. Uh, And furthermore, that it's um, the greatest force for good um, the world has ever seen. This is an, an assertion that was recently made in print in the Wall Street Journal by none other than um, former Vice President Dick Cheney. Uh, It's a very common assertion. It carries a great deal of weight among many Americans. A lot of polls have been done recently in the last few years that have demonstrated that most Americans, an easy majority of Americans, believe that America is the greatest country in the world. And the idea carries with it a lot of uh, theological uh, baggage. In fact, that's really the, uh, the thesis of my book, is that American exceptionalism is, in many ways, a theological assertion, or really it carries with it a set of theological assertions, mainly that God has chosen America by a special election, and that God has given America a special mission in the world, that America is a morally innocent people, so that everything that America does is right by definition. America has a glory about it and about its history and its actions that other nations don't have. And, you know, these are, these are just some of the theological assertions that go along with many articulations or a religious articulation of American exceptionalism. But these really strong religious themes don't have to come along with American exceptionalism. American exceptionalism is also articulated in sort of a political or a social construct that centers around or is based on the ideals of the founding, like equality or individual rights, representative 
democracy, the common good, justice. These ideals uh, present America as an example to the world. So looking at the preamble to the Constitution, the preamble to the Constitution articulates these ideals. The Declaration of Independence articulates those ideals. And these ideals are inclusive. They aren't really necessarily located in America by itself, but America stands as an example to the rest of humanity to show what a just political community can look like to the world. So this is, these are some of the common themes and what I've sort of called these differentiations, closed American exceptionalism, which is a very religious, nationalistic view, very exclusionary view, and then open American exceptionalism, which is more an exemplarist view, which is based on moral ideals and political ideals. Is this a term that just conservatives or liberals are using, or do all Americans and their politicians use American exceptionalism or believe in its tenets? That's a great question. It's pretty clear that all Americans from both political stripes and both religious Americans and not so religious Americans have used the term and have expressed the term. Most most notably to watch is, is Obama, President Obama, who uses the term a lot in his rhetoric. And it's a really fascinating study in and of itself to trace sort of an, an evolution in how President Obama has expressed and articulated American exceptionalism from the beginning of his presidency to most recently speech he gave in Selma at the uh, Pettus Bridge, speech that he gave concerning the Syrian crisis back in 2013, where he called America exceptional because America doesn't just stand by while other nations victimize their own people and so forth and so on. So, so Obama's articulation of exceptionalism is very consistent with what I'm calling open American exceptionalism, which is also another key aspect to open American exceptionalism is to acknowledge the flaws in American history, sins against justice, sins against its own people, sins against other peoples in the world, and to acknowledge those flaws and seek to change and rectify and correct those flaws. This is what sort of animates President Obama's idea of exceptionalism and personally, I really resonate with this, and I think it's very interesting, a very interesting comparison between President Obama and George W. Bush and Dick Cheney, who have you know, what I'm calling a very closed view of exceptionalism, which is very much animated by Protestant Christianity, um, by appeals to God and appeals to divine responsibility to God to be faithful, to uh, carry out his mission in the world. You know, Obama's his articulation does not really carry this strong religious articulation. It's very interesting to watch those two, those two views sort of play out. I am interested in the historical origins of these ideas, but as we continue to define this term, it sounds to me that in some ways it's a militaristic term in that there is this idea that America is great because it stands for justice and freedom and that Americans are willing to fight to preserve justice and freedom at home, as well as to promote it abroad. Is that a correct take on the meaning of American exceptionalism? Historically, yes, very much so. And both open and closed American exceptionalist articulations carry a very militant type of a view to it. For example, um, Abraham Lincoln is one of the very first, well, he's probably the first president, I'm sure he is, the first president who would articulate an open form of exceptionalism. And, you know, he's doing that in the context of a great civil war and that the forces of the United States are going to be carrying forward American ideals through force of arms and compelling, of course, the restoration of the Union, compelling the Southern Rebellion to cease and also to enfranchise African-American slaves by force of arms and Certainly, this sort of militaristic take on exceptionalism is very much a part of both views of exceptional close and open as they've been articulated down through history. Would it be correct to say that American exceptionalism is a different form of patriotism or nationalism? I mean, you're a patriotic American. You believe in freedom and justice. You believe America is great. So really, there's a difference between American exceptionalism as nationalism and American exceptionalism as patriotism. 
And nationalism is very much uh, sort of a, a very jingoistic, definitely militaristic expression of exceptionalism, a very exclusivist, and what I'm, what I'm really calling closed exceptionalism. It can be used, so this articulation of exceptionalism can be used to justify something like preemptive war, a preemptive invasion of Iraq, for example. But patriotism does not necessitate this nationalistic element in exceptionalism. You can appeal to exceptionalism as a patriot and express love for country in sort of a just way. By that, I mean love for country that is properly measured and properly applied. So patriotism would acknowledge a proper place for devotion to country, to loyalty, gratitude, even sacrifice for your country. But patriotism does not, is not blind. It's not a blind love for your country where you refuse to acknowledge that your country is not innocent and your country has been guilty of sins in the past and is always potentially, you know, the potential for, for sin against justice is always there. So a patriot along an open exceptionalist sort of line would see that there is room to advance, room to improve, room to learn from the failures of the past so as not to repeat them. And again, an open exceptionalist view carries this form of patriotism with it, and a closed exceptionalist view would be nationalistic, exclusionary, jingoistic, and ultimately, I would say, as a Christian, as a religious person, idolatrous against what I would say a biblical view of Christian doctrine would be. What I hear are there are two types of American exceptionalism. Both believe that America is great, but open exceptionalism, the patriotic one, is one where America is great, but yes, it has faults. Whereas closed exceptionalism or the nationalistic one is one where no one wants to admit that America has faults. That is correct. That is exactly what I'm saying in the book. Earlier, you mentioned that there are aspects of religious faith in American exceptionalism. Is that what you mean by civil religion? Is American exceptionalism a form of civil religion? And what do you mean by that? Yeah, that's, that's another great question. Um, civil religion is a fascinating sort of a religious dimension in human existence, human life. Robert Bella, who was a sociologist, wrote a, a very famous essay back in 1967 called Civil Religion in America. And Robert Bella is sort of recognized as the scholar who opened the field of the study of civil religion in, uh, since the 60s. And in that essay, he attempted to describe the American way of life in religious terms. And so civil religion has been articulated most recently also uh, by a scholar in uh, at Manhattanville College, Peter Gardella. He, he talks about it in terms of texts, monuments, places, myths. Uh, national myths, rituals, images, these things sort of teach us or, or articulate civil religion. Things like, uh, you know, texts like the Bill of Rights or a text like the Declaration of Independence, a monument like the Lincoln Memorial, a place like a national park or a national battlefield, a myth like the flag over Fort McHenry in the War of 1812. Uh, the, this, in, in the national anthem, of course, we sing about the, the flag being still there after a night of bombardment, British bombardment at Fort McHenry. A ritual like the changing of the guard at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, the lighting of the Christmas tree um, at the White House. These are all aspects of civil religion that unify Americans around transcendent ideas that are unique really to America or that Americans think is unique to America. But over, over the last few years, the field has shifted about the, the study of civil religion, that civil religion is a less popular term these days, partly because it's hard to define, and also partly because what scholars see and what, what they've sort of taught us is that there isn't maybe necessarily one civil religion that all Americans sort of recognize, that there are maybe you know a, a diverse range of civil religions. And civil religion as a whole is really a political sort of a social construct that's malleable and that changes over time and changes over the generations in terms of how Americans understand their country and their place in the world. Recently, um, scholar Art Remillard, he, he gave us a book called Southern Civil Religions. And what he talks about is that civil religion is really translated in something called the good society. 
he asserts that the term good society has sort of replaced the term civil religion. And the good society would be like an ideal state that preserves unity and justice and peace. And, and the key that he sort of underscores in his book is that civil religion is not monolithic. It, it's sort of expressed by, you know, in different ways by different groups. So there's not one civil religion. That's what I'm trying to say here. And in American exceptionalism, I would say that American exceptionalism is definitely an expression of civil religion. And it's an expression of, of two civil religions that I'm identifying. So the things that I've said about American exceptionalism being nationalistic and patriotic, one being religious and one other being more political or social, this is also reflected in two ways that civil religion is expressed. One is a very religious articulation or manifestation, one that borrows heavily from the Protestant Christian tradition specifically, and then another one that is more animated by American founding ideals, like equality, like individual rights, democracy, and so forth. And so, yes, American exceptionalism, both closed and open American exceptionalisms are aspects of two forms of civil religion one which is very religious, and one which is more of a political construct. We really need to pay attention to what these politicians and op-ed writers and newspaper writers say and write about American exceptionalism, because there seems to be, as many different Americans, there's many different American exceptionalism and civil religion ideas. Yes, very much so. I mean, you really do have to pay close attention, because they never define their terms when they're talking from their podiums. But the definitions that they're using, their understandings of the term American exceptionalism, come through in their positions on policy. And so when a politician uses the term American exceptionalism, we can't assume that they mean one thing or the other. Let's look into the historical context of these ideas. In American exceptionalism and civil religion, John states that the idea of American exceptionalism originated with the Puritans who settled in Massachusetts in 1630. John, would you tell us about the Puritans and how they brought ideas of American exceptionalism to what became the United States? Yeah, so the Puritan colonies, beginning part of the 17th century, we're talking about Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut, Plymouth, New Haven, New Hampshire, and um, depending who you asked, <laughs> in the early 17th century, Rhode Island, although Rhode Island is sort of seen as a maverick colony by those in Massachusetts and Connecticut and the other New England colonies. New Haven, of course, it's absorbed into Connecticut in 1665. Uh, Plymouth is absorbed into Massachusetts in 1691. And the Puritans, they're indebted to the Calvinistic uh, theological tradition. They escape persecution um, in the early 17th century, particularly after James I took over uh, as the King of England and Scotland after the death of Elizabeth in 1603. And when Charles II comes to, or Charles I rather, comes to the throne in 1625, the Puritans had been enduring persecution at the hands of the uh, Church of England for, you know, almost 20 years. And many of them just thought, well, this is just getting too much for us, and they came to America to establish what they foresaw would be a pure society, a pure Christian commonwealth that would ultimately be serve as, a, as an example of a Christian state, a Christian commonwealth. And so John Winthrop, when he leads um, the colonists to start the colony of Massachusetts Bay in 1630, he, he writes a sermon called A Model of Christian Charity, which is a very famous sermon that was appealed to. It was mentioned by John F. Kennedy in his inaugural address. Of course, Ronald Reagan talked about uh, that speech quite a bit, or that sermon quite a bit. It's unclear whether or not he actually delivered that speech, or if it was just something that he wrote. It's unclear where exactly he delivered that speech, whether it was on the ship, the Arbella that they were coming over, if he was before they left, or it was when they got here. We don't really know. But Nevertheless, in the model of Christian charity, he makes the very famous statement that we shall be as a city upon a hill, which, of course, is a quote from Christ in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, where Christ en encourages his followers to be an example, to be a light, and that let their light shine so that they, people would glorify their Father in heaven. Well, John Winthrop uses that language to, and applies it to the colonists in Massachusetts Bay that they're going to 
serve as a as the model state, the model Christian state. They're going to be a pure state. They're going to be a society that is in covenant with God, and that uh, in, in entering into this covenant with God, they were going to follow His ways. They were going to adhere to theological purity, that they were going to live their lives morally according to the biblical mandates. And in, in so doing, God was going to bless them. God was going to establish them in this land, just as he did the Old Testament Jewish nation in, in the Promised Land, after Moses had led them out of slavery in Egypt and brought them into the Promised Land. Ultimately, that would be under the leadership of Joshua, which is outlined for us in the first five books of the Old Testament. So John Winthrop is an example of a Puritan leader who sees the colonists in America, the people that are establishing these pure societies in New England, as being uh, covenant people um, in relationship to God. And that as long as they were faithful to God and their calling to be a pure society and a Christian commonwealth, that God would bless them. But if they, you know, if they backslid, if they fell back into sin, if they weren't careful to be morally pure and doctrinally pure, then God would, as John Winthrop said, would break out against them uh, to curse them, to raise up their enemies against them, to bring natural calamities on them like droughts and like floods and famine and these kinds of things, pestilence. And so this is the way that they see themselves. They see themselves very much in, in uh, relationship to God expressed through a divine covenant. So the Puritans ultimately create a sense of American patriotism early on. Now, it's the early Puritans, they don't see themselves as Americans, of course. They still see themselves as Englishmen. However, what they do is they give us the idea that America is a new Israel. They give us the idea that the Puritans, they are the ones who are fulfilling the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. They're giving American patriotism a notion of being chosen by God, being tasked by God for certain things to do in the world. They see themselves as being at war with an antichrist, and they are constantly looking at themselves, looking inwardly to make sure that they are pure and that they are still walking with God. So John Winthrop would be an example of this. Michael Wigglesworth, who is a, a preacher in the mid-17th century Edward Johnson, who writes a very famous sermon in 1654, Wonderworking Providence of Zion's Savior. It's really not really a sermon. It's more of a history of Massachusetts. But to read this history is like reading epic poetry, really. It's a recounting of the deeds of God in the lives of the Puritans in Massachusetts in the early part of the 17th century. So the Puritans really give us the notion of American exceptionalism because they are a people set apart by God. And that idea that the Puritans articulated in their sermons, in their histories, in their tracts, in their journals, and so forth and so on, these things spread into the American psyche and consciousness by the time you get to the Revolution. For the most part, the Puritans are in New England. So how does this idea of we are elect, God has chosen us, we are God-chosen people, spread down to the South, did any other Christian religions or non-Christian religions, such as Quakerism, Judaism, various African religions, or other Christian denominations contribute to the idea of American exceptionalism? Yeah, definitely. And this is something that, you know, as I was writing the book, I became more and more interested in. And it's something that I really would like to do more study on and, and write about. But real quick, to answer your question... Interestingly enough, once we get into the late 18th century and early 19th century, you see these very Puritan ideals being expressed through other denominations, particularly the Presbyterian denomination, and through the expansion of the United States into the Western territories. So at the end of the 18th century, with the victory over Britain and the Revolutionary War, those Western territories, the Old Northwest, you know, that region from really from uh, that's north and west of the Ohio River, going up to Minnesota and to the boundary of the United States after uh, the Treaty of Paris of 1783, which would have been the Mississippi River. Someone like Lyman Beecher, who dies in 1863, he is a Presbyterian. He is uh, the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe. He's the first president of Lane Theological Seminary, which is in Cincinnati. 
And he, he gives a speech called Plea for the West, and he talks about the United States is destined to lead the way in moral and political emancipation of the world. So this moral plus political emancipation is very much borrowed from Puritan strains. You can definitely see a Puritan strain in that. He talks about the destiny of the United States is tied to the destiny of the West. And this destinarian language is very, very much Puritan. He thinks that Christian education is essential to the development of the West. And this Christian education is directly tied to the destiny of the West. And the destiny of the West is very much tied to the destiny of the United States. And so this emphasis on education is also heavily Puritan. Another example of someone would be Elias Boudinot, who's one of the founders of the American Bible Society. He's also a Presbyterian. He's a really interesting figure because he sees there's a connection between the American continent, between the land of the American continent and the native peoples of the American continent. Uh, the United States is a political entity, and the Old Testament and Old Testament theology sees this connection between these three. But, um, but Aaron Shalev talks about this in his book, uh, American Zion, but Boudinot sees the Native Americans in America as being descendants of the ten lost tribes of Israel. This is a common theory in the early 19th century. Even if, as that theory began to sort of wane as you get to the 1830s and 1840s, still the idea that America will be the stage for the outworking of God's plan for history sort of the physical stage by which God would, would redeem the whole world. This is where God's redemption of the world would begin, would be in America. This is a very Puritan concept. Here it's expressed by uh, non-congregationalist leaders at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, and these views expand and extend south, and they expand and extend west, so that it's really difficult to know where does this destinarian Puritanism, national destinarian Puritanism, where does it start in Puritan theology, congregational theology, and where does it end? You know, it's, the, the lines get so blurred because these views just expand and sort of create an American notion of identity, an American notion of patriotism. As you talk about westward expansion and talk about Beecher and Boudinot and their ideas about expansion in Native Americans, I'm struck by how similar it is to the idea of manifest destiny. Would you tell us about manifest destiny and whether or not it's a product of American exceptionalism? Yeah, definitely. So manifest destiny is a belief that comes into prominence um, in the 1840s and 1850s prior to the Civil War. It wanes a little bit during the Civil War period, but then is re-expressed again in the late 19th century and early 20th, especially with the Spanish-American War. And the person that's most often credited with coining the term Manifest Destiny is John L. O'Sullivan, who he lived in the 19th century. He died in 1895. He was a New Yorker. He uh, edited the influential uh, journal called the United States Magazine of Democratic Review. Manifest destiny means that um, God has ordained the United States to overspread uh, the North American continent to the Pacific Ocean, possibly to even expand uh, across the entire North American continent to absorb then the republics of Central America and also Canada to the north, and perhaps even to overspread South America as well so that the flag would fly from pole to pole. And so during the summer of 1845, um, while Congress was debating whether or not to annex Texas, O'Sullivan pens an editorial defending the annexation of Texas and its admission into the Union. So here's a quote from O'Sullivan. He says that other powers seek to check the fulfillment of our manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by Providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. And inherent in the notion of, of manifest destiny are really two things. One would be providential certainty. That is that we can say with certainty what God is up to in terms of his plan for the destiny of America to expand and to liberate the backward peoples of like in, um, in Mexico uh, to pacify, if necessary, the Native Americans, and if, if they wouldn't be pacified and amalgamated into the American nation, then they would be eliminated, for example. 
and uh, also Anglo-American superiority to uh, any other race. So Anglo-Americans would, would be superior, of course, to, to Mexicans, to Latinos, to the West and South of, of the United States. And also Anglo-Americans would have a natural superiority and a moral superiority to African-Americans who were at the times, of course, enslaved in the, in the South. So O'Sullivan uses his platform as, a, as an editor and as a writer uh, in the 1840s and the 1850s. And he's very, his writings are very popular very much accepted, uh, especially in the Democratic Party, which was the party of uh, territorial expansion, and very much opposed by, uh, particularly by Northern Whigs, particularly New England Whigs, who were opposed to the United States going to war against Mexico in 1846. And so they were opposed to the Mexican War because they were afraid that slavery would be expanded into Texas and, and ultimately into the West. So those are some of the highlights of Manifest Destiny. It carries with it a great deal of Christian themes and borrows heavily from Protestant Christian theology, which makes it definitely an aspect of, of a closed American exceptionalism as, it, as it's manifested in the 19th century. Did early Americans use American exceptionalism to justify slavery? They do so in an indirect way. They do so in one way to affirm Anglo-American superiority, white superiority, over um, people of black skin. But here's what ties American, closed American exceptionalism to slavery directly. It's territorial expansion, it's beginning really with the, with the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. With territorial expansion comes the question of, will slavery expand into the newly acquired territories? And so the question is asked and addressed, and of course, the Missouri Compromise, the Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, I mean, these are great compromises that are uh, engineered by the United States Congress in order to answer the question about the propriety of extending slavery into the territories. And of course, ultimately, the question would be answered in the, in the Civil War. So territorial expansion is key. It's obviously key to the idea of American expansion, uh, exceptionalism through the idea of manifest destiny, that it's God's will that America should expand and to conquer the North American continent. And then slavery becomes necessary to the economy of the United States as a whole. Slavery will be the engine of economic growth and the economic power of the United States. It'll form the foundation of the economic power of the United States from the 19th century all, all the way into the 20th century. Slavery will be the, the key to American uh, economic growth and American economic power. And so the, the notion that uh, the United States is the, the richest country in the world and the richest, most powerful country in the world uh, in human history is directly achievable through slavery and as it uh, you know as it was manifested in America prior to the Civil War, so these are some of the ways that slavery is connected to American exceptionalism. I don't know that American exceptionalism would say you know, that there is a direct, explicit, sort of rhetorical element to how slavery would be tied to American exceptionalism. But but slavery is necessary to American exceptionalism. At least that is religious closed exceptionalism. Not so much open exceptionalism. It seems to me that your research suggests that American exceptionalism exists, but that it is a concept that has evolved and continues to evolve over time. But as it evolves and adapts to each era of its existence, all the way back to the Puritans and, and forward to our present day, it seems to ebb and flow between open exceptionalism, the idea that America is great, it will defend and protect liberty and freedom and justice, but it's willing to acknowledge its flaws, and this closed concept of exceptionalism, which is America is great, we believe in liberty, freedom and justice, but Americans don't want anybody to tell them that they have faults, such as right. fighting against Mexico in the Mexican-American War, or... Right you know, justifying keeping slaves in bondage. Yes. Exceptionalism definitely evolves over the course of time. One of the things I argue in, for in the book is that exceptionalism is like sort of picture like a um, multi-stemmed maple tree. Exceptionalism has its roots in theology, in politics, in political theory, political philosophy, 
particularly of 17th century uh, England and 18th century America. It has exegetical roots through the preaching, the revolutionary preaching in the late 18th century, starting with Jonathan Mayhew's Discourse on Unlimited Submission, which he preaches in 1750 on the 101st anniversary of the death of Charles II. And it also has historiographical roots because some of the you know, the earliest uh, American historians, particularly George Bancroft, write American history in the 19th century in a very exceptionalist way. They present America in providential terms and as a favored nation of God. But in the 19th century, because of slavery, because of territorial expansion, because of the Civil War, American exceptionalism begins to have these two different varying articulations, one which is closed and one which is open. And so John L. O'Sullivan would be somebody who would represent uh, a further articulation of closed exceptionalism as it develops around the expansion of the United States and the expansion of slavery. But then Abraham Lincoln would be someone who really begins to articulate a very developed form of open exceptionalism, which is much more inclusive and much more, much more aimed at humanity as a whole and animated by American founding ideals. Uh, particularly as expressed in the Declaration of Independence and the statement that uh, all men are created equal. This is all over uh, Lincoln's writings and speeches. It, it is really, it's, an, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to read a, many of Lincoln's speeches and writings because his view of equality comes forth so strongly and it, it really um, animates his entire political career especially from 1858 when he runs for, for the Illinois Senate all the way until you know the end of the Civil War. Then, you know, in the late 19th century, open exceptionalism is sort of replaced by closed exceptionalism as America embarks upon a, um, an imperialistic mission to gather for itself a world empire. With World War I, you know, Woodrow Wilson sees America as a messianic nation, and so closed exceptionalism reappears again. But then after World War II, during World War II and after World War II, especially during the Cold War, notions of open exceptionalism begin to be articulated more so again, because people are beginning to question um, whether or not, well, is it really appropriate for us to conceive of this cosmic battle between good and evil, the United States representing the forces of good and the Soviet Union representing the forces of evil. Someone like Ronald Reagan would, would always, in his speeches, talk about how the, the moral regeneracy, the innocence of the American nation, and that you know, there's nothing that America could ever really do wrong, and, and such a, had such a hard time really reconciling the fact that there are moral ambiguities in the American character and American history. In the protest movement, Vietnam War protest movements, the civil rights movement of the 60s, the 50s and 60s, um, concepts of open exceptionalism are expressed by Martin Luther King. They're expressed by Malcolm X, B believe it or not. I mean, Malcolm X and, and Martin Luther King have a very similar idea of what justice means, that laws that are passed by a legislature can actually be unjust. Just because you have a law doesn't mean that the law is always right and always just. I mean, both Malcolm and Martin Luther King express this in their speeches and writings. So, yeah, so definitely all through American history, you see closed and open, closed and open, not only being manifested through movements and through figures rhetorically and through protests and these kinds of things, but they're also uh, more and more as time goes by at odds with one another and at war with one another, and competing against one another. In our own day, you see these two articulations opposed to one another, represented in the rhetoric of President Obama, as I said earlier. But just recently, Eric Foner writes, he wrote an op-ed in The Nation, uh, talking about birthright citizenship being an aspect of American exceptionalism. The way he writes about it is very consistent with open American exceptionalism. And then, of course, the op-ed that Dick Cheney wrote with his daughter, Liz Cheney, about uh, you know America having a responsibility across the world, that we're the greatest force for good in the world. That just came out the very next day, right after Eric Foner's um, op-ed came out. And they are definitely at odds with one another. And so as we enter into this presidential contest, we're going to continue to see those articulations being played out at odds with one another. The ideas of American exceptionalism are almost 400 years old. But when was the term coined? 
did the Puritans use the words American exceptionalism? No, they didn't. The term is coined quite recently. The person probably most famous for using the term, uh, applying the term exceptional to America is Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America. And he's, he uses the term, he says, the position of the Americans is therefore quite exceptional. And what he's talking about is that Americans are here in this, uh, on this continent. They're building a civilization. They are more interested in the practical elements of philosophy, not so much contemplative philosophy. So this is what he's talking about. Americans are, are exceptional in that they're interested in different ideas than Europeans are, particularly English Europeans are. So they're, they're exceptional, not in the sense that they're God's chosen people. He's mainly saying there's a difference between Americans, English-speaking Americans and English-speaking Englishmen. More recently, there's an interesting twist in, in how the word exceptionalism is used So during the 20s, Jay Lovestone, who was the head of the American Communist Party, was having to answer to communists in the Soviet Union as to why communist ideas were not taking hold in the United States like they were taking hold in other parts of Europe. And so Stalin is famous for using the word exceptional. America is exceptional because revolutionary, communist revolutionary ideas are not taking hold in America as they are in other places, but he doesn't use that term as a complementary term, and he also doesn't use that term in any religious sense. He's thinking of, you know, a, a communist world revolution that Karl Marx is uh, prophesying in Communist Manifesto, for example. One other articulation that's used by Americans has been a sociological articulation, particularly by the author Sidney Martin Lipset, who writes about America being exceptional but using two sort of ways to describe American exception. He talks about it as a double-edged sword. America is exceptional in that it champions these liberal ideas, but it also is exceptional in bad ways as well. And, for example, you know, the, the incarceration rate in the United States is an exceptional aspect of America, so that there are negative aspects of America that are exceptional and positive aspects that are exceptional. But Lipset is looking at at exceptionalism from a purely sociological framework. Exceptionalism as a patriotic construction is a new thing. It comes along to us in the last 20 or so years and is accentuated by the war on terror and 9-11 and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and so forth. So that's sort of where exceptionalism comes from as a term in itself, but It's not a term that's been used precisely as a a patriotic expression until recently. Alec and Michael would like to know how intertwined the Christian faith or a belief in God is with American exceptionalism. They ask whether a patriotic American must believe that it's God's will that America is an exceptional nation or whether it is enough to believe that America has played an exceptional role in the development of world history. Yeah, that's a great question. And as a Christian religious person myself, I would say that it is not necessary uh, to believe these Christian theological ideas and apply those Christian theological ideas to American patriotism and American exceptionalism. In fact, I would say that using Christian theology to define American identity in exceptionalistic terms is a perversion of the Christian faith, is an expression of idolatry where we're worshiping the nation rather than worshiping God. So I would encourage my Christian brothers and sisters to reject these overtly religious themes in American exceptionalism and recognize them for what they really are, which is really a hijacking of Christian theology uh, in the service of American exclusivistic patriotism, nationalism, really. However, a Christian can definitely hold to an open exceptionalist framework, because open exceptionalism is, uh, it doesn't hijack, it doesn't appropriate Christian theological themes in how it defines American identity. Again, open exceptionalism is a political and a social construct, whereas closed American exceptionalism is a construct that is, it it borrows heavily from Christian theology. But with open exceptionalism, you recognize as a Christian 
that this world is not your home, but at the same time, you know, in sort of the sense that Jeremiah talks about in, in his book and in, in the Hebrew Bible, that it's possible for believers to pray for the welfare of the city in which you live, but still recognizing that your first loyalty is to God. And so that's how I would answer uh, answer the question about, as a Christian, dividing out the appropriate ways to express exceptionalism and inappropriate ways to express it. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. John, in your opinion, what might have happened if the Puritans had not settled in North America? Would the ideas of American exceptionalism have developed? Yes, I do think they would have developed. Because had the Puritans not settled New England, for example, someone would have. And more than likely, it would have been a European civilization that would have settled there. Um, America was being colonized by, of course, as you and your listeners know, by Europe, Western Europeans um, from the 1400s all the way through to the 17th century and, and the 19th century. So it's Europeans that are settling there, and all Europeans brought with them, I'll use the term exceptionalist, religiously exceptionalist ideas with them. The English are not certainly the only ones to think that they're God's chosen people, and they're not the only ones to think that God has given, had given them a particular mission to accomplish in the world. Uh, all the European states believed that they were accomplishing a divine mission when they came to the United States, when they came to America, rather, to South America, it's Central America, and to North America. So whoever came to America, particularly that part of America, would bring with them some nationalistic, more than likely religious nationalistic ideas with them that would have um, filtered into the national consciousness as time goes by. So yes, I would say that even had the Puritans not been the ones to settle there, whoever, whatever European power did settle there would have definitely brought some sort of uh, chosen nation theology with them. John, you have clearly grappled and spent a lot of time thinking about the idea of American exceptionalism. So what are you on to next? What idea will you be grappling with next? You know, I'm so fascinated by this idea of American identity and particularly religion and the, the uh, influence of religion on American identity that my next project is going to be focused on that once again. But it's going to be focused on a question that you asked me uh, earlier, and that is, what are some of the other sources? What are the, some of the non-white, non-male sources for American identity? And a person who really fascinates me and really interests me is W.E.B. Du Bois, because he writes a great deal about the African-American contribution to America and to American identity. So what I want to do is explore how W.E.B. Du Bois gives credit to African Americans for their very noteworthy contribution to American identity. And that's, uh, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm on to now. And it's, a, it's really a fascinating study. For those of us who want to continue this conversation about American exceptionalism and continue to grapple with its ideas, where is the best place to look for more information about you and how to get in contact with you? Yes, well, I have a blog. I blog at, uh, my blog is called To Breathe Your Free Air. It's actually a quote from James Madison. My blog address is johndwilsey.com. And um, you can read some of my musings on American exceptionalism and other issues there. And uh, I have some contact information on my blog there. And anyone is welcome to get in touch with me through my email address that I have listed on my blog. John, thank you so much for helping us deconstruct this idea of American exceptionalism and putting it into stories and terms that we can understand. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Well, that was an interesting conversation, wasn't it? I think it is interesting that the term American exceptionalism 
dates back to the 19th century, but that the ideas the term embodies actually dates back to the 17th century. I'm also fascinated by how the term American exceptionalism really embodies two different meanings. Closed American exceptionalism, the idea that the United States doesn't have to be inclusive of all peoples, and that it already stands as a model for liberty, equality, and justice. And open American exceptionalism, the idea that the United States should be inclusive of all peoples, and that Americans need to work towards helping the United States stand as a model for liberty, equality, and justice, because historically, the United States and its people have not always lived up to this model status. I walk away from our conversation with the realization that American exceptionalism is a simple term that represents a complex set of ideas and values. I, for one, will be paying more attention to how politicians, journalists, and historians use the term and what ideas and values they are trying to convey when they use it. You can find more information about John, his book, American Exceptionalism and Civil Religion, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode, benfranklinsworld.com slash zero five four. Did you know that Ben Franklin's World has an app? We do. It's brand new. You can find out more information by visiting benfranklinsworld.com slash iOS or benfranklinsworld.com slash Android. Would you like to receive the show notes for each and every episode in your inbox? Text BF World to 33444. This action will allow you to sign up for the Franklin Gazette directly from your smartphone or tablet device. It will also send you the link so you can join Poor Richard's Club, our private Facebook community for Ben Franklin's World listeners. Do you love Ben Franklin's World? Would you like to help support the show or find out more information about how you can support the show? If so, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash support or text support BF world to three, three, four, 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 which will send you the link for more information. Finally, what do you think about the ideas of American exceptionalism? Do you think that the United States is exceptional? Do you think that we as Americans should be willing to admit to the faults of our nation? Send your answers to Liz at Ben Franklin's world.com. Tweet me at Liz Covart or post a comment on the show notes page for this episode or in poor Richard's club. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.